On October the 12th, 2016, 24-year-old Alice Ruggles left work with a colleague who drove her home to her apartment in Gateshead, near Newcastle, England. She would never be seen alive again. It was just 12 days between her calling the police and her being murdered. When Alice arrived home from work, someone was waiting for her, her ex-boyfriend, Trimmon Harry Dillon, a man she had rejected. She said no, and that proved to be fatal. This wasn't a case of an assault that escalated to murder. This was always going to be a murder. This was pre-planned. Alice thought she was finally free of Dylan and could move on with her life. I can't forget this. He said, I always get what I want. You know, I always get my own way. I've been like that since I was a little child. Coming home from work, Alice's flatmate found her in the bathroom, lying in a pool of blood. Just came back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Harry Dillon forced his way in and he was armed with a knife. And inside the bathroom, he attacked her with that knife with such force and such severity that the knife made contact with her spine at the back of her throat. Trimmon Harry Dillon didn't love Alice Ruggles. He wanted to possess her, control her, and ultimately destroy her. The only way he could stop her leaving him was to brutally murder her, making Trimmon Harry Dillon one of the world's most evil killers. October the 11th, 2015. 25-year-old Lance Corporal Trimmon Dillon, or Harry to his friends, was serving as a signaller with his regiment in Afghanistan when he saw a photograph of 23-year-old Alice Ruggles on Facebook. Harry instantly reached out and his friend request was accepted. The two of them hit it off and begun an intense social media relationship. And that went on for two or three months while he was posted out in Afghanistan. So we first heard about it, or I first heard about it on um, Christmas that year when, when Alice came home and she was talking about him then. And um, we got the impression he was her boyfriend, but actually at that point they'd never met. I think at the time if I'd known Alice hadn't met him and had said he was her boyfriend, I would have been quite shocked, but I didn't discover that, unfortunately, till after she'd been murdered. The speed and intensity of Dylan's relationship with Alice was nothing new for him. That he would meet a woman, profess almost immediate love for her, that a very intense relationship would develop, that he would seek to control that relationship and control his partner, all the time cheating on them behind their backs. Dylan's possessive, controlling behaviour begun to take its toll on Alice. Well, it became obvious that, that Alice was becoming unhappy, the fact that she was she, she was losing weight, she looked physically different, um, she lost her verve and vigour for life, she was losing friends all over the place. The cheating and Dylan's lying was the final straw for Alice. Leaving a relationship can be a very high-risk time for violence and for homicide because by leaving, by making the decision to go, um, you're compromising the perpetrator's control over you. And no woman was allowed to walk away from Trimmon Harry Dillon. If he couldn't have her, nobody else could. This killer's story begins in 1990 in India. Trimmon Dillon was the only child born into an affluent, devout Sikh family. Trimmon Dillon is something of an enigma. We don't know a lot about his background. We know that he's from India. We know that his father was quite high ranking in the army. We know that his mother was a graduate of a high profile university in India. As a boy, Trimmon received a first class education. He went on to study strategy management at university, which involves spending two years overseas at the Queen Margaret University near Edinburgh in Scotland. 
We know he has quite a traditional nuclear family background there. Um, beyond that, we don't know very much, but I think we can say that what is important to him are things like hierarchy and status and power and tradition, and he might have some quite fixed ideas of what relationships look like. In September 2010, at the age of 19, Trim and Dylan arrived in the UK. He became known as Harry amongst his fellow students. In December, while still at university, Harry applied to join the British Army. Which you, I suppose you would expect. Son of an army lieutenant colonel. Probably always thought of himself certainly as a, an army type. Um, clearly liked something about it. Dylan's UK citizenship was not complete, so he couldn't apply to become an army officer. He trained at Catterick in North Yorkshire and passed out in May 2012 as a private. He was posted with the Royal Regiment of Scotland to Canterbury in Kent. So you can see inside this young man, quite handsome, when he wants to be relatively charming, but also there's something odd, you know, there's just that something about him. I think one or two of his army colleagues described him as not really one of us. It was just something slightly off. It was in Kent in September 2012 that Harry Dillon met an 18-year-old Bulgarian student who later became his girlfriend. And this was a relationship that had proceeded at an incredibly fast pace. And that's something that we see very often in these abusive situations where somebody like Dylan is taking control of somebody else. In the spring of 2013, Dylan proposed. Delighted with his engagement, the next day he returned to India alone to visit his family for a few weeks. This break, however, gave his young fiance time to reconsider their relationship. She dumps him on Skype, which absolutely infuriated him. Um, and he flew back from India early and really lost his temper in, in every way. To add insult to injury, Dylan's now ex fiance had a new boyfriend. Dylan doesn't take it lying down, and it's one of his characteristics is he can't stand rejection. He absolutely hates it. He believes he's entitled to things. I was entitled as a child, I'm entitled as an adult. If you're the woman I've chosen, then I'm entitled to you. Dylan started stalking her and harassing her with derogatory and unpleasant texts, telling her he wanted to make her cry. She's on her way to, to meet her new partner, and there's an incident where he spits in her face, he acts very aggressively towards her new partner, and he uses language like, what are you doing with my girlfriend? This is my girlfriend. It's all possessive language. So he sees this ex-partner as something that he owns, and no other man has the right to take that away from him. After the assault, his ex-fiancée reported Dylan to the police, but no criminal charges were brought against him. He was later issued with a restraining order to stay away from her. It's incredibly common for people like Dylan to assault ex-girlfriends more than once to engage in any kind of behaviour to take that control back. So this is not a flash in the pan. This is not a one-off. This kind of behaviour is part of a course of conduct. It was easy for Dylan to comply with the restraining order against him. Shortly after the incident in Kent, he was deployed almost 500 miles away to Glencorse Barracks in Edinburgh, Scotland. Dylan was a signaller in the British Army with ambitions to join the Special Reconnaissance Regiment of the SAS. By now he's a Lance Corporal. He's been promoted. You can see a sort of swagger in him, in his step. And you can see impressionable, perhaps younger, women uh, being rather taken with him. 25-year-old Dylan regularly used dating sites, apps and social media to hook up with women. He was clearly uh, highly motivated when it came to female company. I think he fancied himself as a bit of a gigolo, actually, that he thought, I can have any woman I want. I think there was a lot of that. 
about him. In September 2015, Harry Dillon was deployed with his regiment to Afghanistan. He was not a combat soldier. His role was essentially in communications far from the front line. On the 11th of October 2015, while serving in Afghanistan, Harry Dillon saw a Facebook post from an old university friend. Dylan first saw Alice on social media. She was a friend of one of his friends on social media. And I think Dylan sees this platform as a bit of a shopping catalog for new girlfriends. He's literally going on there, liking the look of Alice and saying, I want that one. The post Dylan saw was a selfie snap of his friend on holiday in Sri Lanka with a girlfriend. The girlfriend was 23-year-old Alice Ruggles, a Northumbria University graduate who lived in Gateshead near Newcastle, just over 100 miles from Edinburgh. It really does reinforce that extent to which he sees women as objects, as possessions that he can just select. So he gets in touch with Alice's friend and says, this is one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I have to meet her, words to that effect. And this is how they, they first come to meet. And I think this really does set the tone for the relationship. I'm in control. I am choosing you. I'm the one that has power. Trim and Harry Dillon had found his new obsession. October the 11th, 2015, Sri Lanka. Alice Ruggles was on holiday when she received a Facebook friend request from Trim and Harry Dillon. Alice was careful with her social media accounts but Harry was a friend of a friend, and she happily accepted his request. It wasn't that she was desperate for somebody to go out with. She just, she, you know, she liked meeting people. Um, she probably had lots of people who wanted to go out with her, but she wasn't someone who would lead people on. She just, you know, if it, if it was uh, the right thing, that's what she'd do. Dylan and Alice began chatting and hit it off. From then on, they were in constant communication. And by the time we got to about December, Alice was telling, telling everyone she was in a relationship with this person. She put it on Facebook that she was in a relationship. And she told me that he, he was her new boyfriend. But there was one thing Alice didn't make clear to her mum. I actually didn't realise that she'd never met him. He was a soldier serving in Afghanistan, so obviously they couldn't meet up. But, but I think, you know, moving forward at that pace and describing yourselves as partners is, is wrong, really, if you haven't met each other. It's, you're just friends to, to me. But it's a sort of sign that somebody is a controlling person if they make the relationship move faster than it naturally should. I think this is where the control had started to come in. So offenders like Dylan are able to control from a distance. You don't need them to be physically present to be exerting quite a lot of power over their partners. In January 2016, just over three months since they'd met on Facebook, Dylan came home on leave and the couple finally met in person. And they had a lovely time. And Alice, um, Alice was so taken by him. She said he was kind and thoughtful and he paid for things and he, he just wanted to keep her happy. That was how she saw it. And she said, Mum, I think he's, he is the one. He's just wonderful. And they spent a week in Newcastle together and then they spent a week in Edinburgh together. After two wonderful weeks, Dylan returned to Afghanistan to finish his tour and the couple continued their intense social media relationship. But one of the problems about the whole Facebook thing was that he was um, he was quite controlling about that and he wanted to know where she was, um, who she was going out with, what she was wearing, and all those, all those things that sort of can be disguised as being really caring and thoughtful, you know, like, I really want to know what you're wearing and I want to know where you are and I want to know who you're with. But if you look at them from the other side, actually, they're really quite sinister. Um, unfortunately, I don't think Alice saw them as sinister at all at the time. In April 2016, Dylan's tour in Afghanistan ended 
and he was deployed back to barracks in Edinburgh. Once back in the UK, Dylan was keen to meet Alice's family. We first met him, and then it was May Bank Holiday weekend, so they came down for the weekend. And I, I remember thinking that, that, I mean, looking back on this, there was nothing at the time, and this is one of the scary things, there was nothing at the time that made me think, I don't like this guy. There's something you know, not, not, not right about this guy. Really nothing. I mean, yes, I could tell him, I could tell that he was giving me answers to, to questions, you know, that, that, that he wanted me to hear and this sort of thing. But I'm guessing a lot of lads could have done that. So it, there was nothing that, that I picked up at that time that led me to think there was anything worrying about him. Things don't start off in an abusive way. Things start off with this individual being everything that the ideal boyfriend is supposed to be. Because if abusers were abusive all of the time, nobody would go out with them, nobody would date them, nobody would marry them. So he's got that initial charm offensive down to a real T. It wasn't long before Alice's family and friends began to notice changes in her behavior. One of the things that had happened was that Alice had fallen out with the boys she shared a house with, which was really unusual for her. She didn't tend to fall out with people like that. He just sort of amplified everything that was happening to make it an unhappy um, atmosphere in the house. And then he started saying to Alice um, that he, he had some money and he would buy a flat in Newcastle and she could live in the flat this talk about possibly um, buying a house so she could live in it and this sort of thing, you know, in the, and they've only been sort of seeing each other for a couple of months, is, is pushing things worryingly fast. Alice's demeanour also began to change. And there were sort of attempts to undermine her confidence and make her feel that she was not really a worthy person, which is... It's not really how she felt. I mean, she was quite secure in how she was about herself. And, and he managed to make her feel more insecure, which was unfortunately something we didn't really notice creeping on. There were several tactics that Dylan used when he was essentially breaking down Alice's self-confidence, because this is what this is all about. It's, it's a liberty crime. It's about taking away somebody's sense of self. And he starts off with these little criticisms. And they're, they're kind of veiled criticisms, because very often they're presented as something that I, I only have your best interests at heart, or I'm only trying to help you. This is just a suggestion. And then you start with the criticisms becoming, you know, a little bit more cutting and then it, it descends into to even more you know humiliation and, and control. Alice started to become isolated from her friends even the best friend who'd introduced her to Dylan on Facebook just six months ago. And I was really shocked by that because that's you know I'm quite a feminist and <laughs> that's not be told what to do. And I said, well, why is that? And, and she said, oh, well, because we had a bit of an argument about something. And, and he said that she's a poisonous person and he doesn't want me to be around anybody who's so poisonous and horrible. When we look at Alice, we don't see somebody who we might consider to be a stereotypical victim of abuse. She's somebody who's independent, she's go-getting, she's gregarious, she's got a really good network of friends. And I think there's a sense in which Dylan saw her as a bit of a challenge, to be honest. Um, he thought, well, if, if I can break this person, you know, I, I really am fantastic. Over the next couple of months, she started to, to lose weight a bit and she started to, well, she was starting to lose confidence and as we discovered, she was starting to lose friends. Dylan was an incredibly controlling person and he, he set in place a lot of rules around relationships. He was very critical of Alice talking to male friends, engaging with male colleagues at work. Um, he had this paranoia that, that she was cheating on him and he would, would constantly be sharing these views with her. But Alice wasn't the one doing the cheating. 
But all the time, he was doing all of this stuff behind Alice's back. So he was contacting other women online. He was arranging to meet up with them. He was having casual sex with them. So there's an awful lot of double standards going on. And that's because he feels completely entitled to behave in this way. And this is the, the, the very essence of misogyny. This is, it's one set of rules for me, and it's a whole other set of rules for you. One of the women Dylan was in contact with messaged Alice and told her what her boyfriend was up to. And this is the final straw for her, because Alice has a very clear line in the sand when it comes to relationships, clearly. And she's not going to tolerate this kind of behaviour. And I think this is testament to Alice's strength of character and her moral compass. Despite Dylan's denial that he was cheating on her, Alice didn't believe him. There had been too many lies. In a tearful phone call to her mum, Alice told her that she'd ended their relationship. I don't think he actually knows what the truth is. I don't think he knows what being honest is all about. And For Alice, honesty was such an important thing that she really felt uncomfortable about that. But Dylan, being Dylan, never takes no for an answer. He goes into full manipulative mode. He can't have his masculinity questioned by some mere woman. It's a very misogynist, it's a very male dominant attitude. And it unfortunately extends to the worst possible outcome. In early August 2016, much to the relief of her family and friends, 24-year-old Alice Ruggles had told Harry Dillon that she no longer wanted to be in a relationship with him. She moves out of a house that we, she's been sharing with uh, housemates who, who've seen this decline in her character. She moves in with a friend. Uh, she's working for a media hub in uh, Newcastle, and she moves in with someone who works there. And they have a ground floor flat in Gateshead which they share. Alice was trying to regain control of her life. At this point, Dylan is very much of the mindset, I will get what I want. I am going to get Alice back because she is mine. So he starts bombarding her with phone calls. Alice, please. Please, 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 please. I can't do it. Please call me back, please. I just want to speak to you, there's nothing else. What's going on here is this is a fully grown adult man essentially having a tantrum, you know, drawing on these different tactics out of desperation in the hope that one of them is going to work. I don't even know if you're getting me some voice messages, but please can you call me back? Thank you. Dylan was relentless and bombarded Alice day and night. Her phone was constantly pinging and, 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 and it was always him. And she wanted him to move on, of course. He became the boyfriend who wouldn't go away. She, she wanted him to move on. But this isn't a, a guy who's lovesick, who's missing his ex-girlfriend. This is somebody who's had something taken away from him that he feels entitled to. Alice blocked Dylan's phone number, though she could still hear his voicemails. And his particular technique was the veil threat. So he'd never say, I'm going to do this to you. He would say, if I was a bad guy, I'd do this to you, but I'm not, so I won't. It was always framed like that. Alice tried to block Dylan on Facebook and found that her account had been hacked. He was controlling her, her social media. So he'd actually um, got control of her Facebook account I'm guessing she, she left her phone or laptop around um, with it still switched on, so he took the password. And, and she knew that he had the password, and he then um, meant that he could control what was on the account. Monitoring and surveillance behaviours is something we come across a lot in cases like this. And very often, the victim won't be aware of the fact that the perpetrator is essentially spying on them. The availability of, of spyware and this kind of technology is, is really quite widespread now. Dylan claimed to have intimate photographs of Alice and threatened to release them on her social media accounts. Now, she had no idea what those photographs were. and. Um... She was really anxious about it. She didn't tell me about this till 
quite a little while later because I think she felt that it was some it was an embarrassing thing to talk about. It was embarrassing to talk to your mum about it. And I suspect she would be embarrassed to go to the police about it. And so that was perhaps the reason why she didn't go to the police. Needing a break, Alice went to visit her sister in Germany, who introduced her to a new man. She really liked him, and they arranged to meet soon back in England. The only people who knew about Alice's new friend was her family. Nowhere on social media or anything was, was this mentioned. But of course, it, Alice was WhatsApping him, and we knew all about this in the family WhatsApp. We had a, a, a family WhatsApp going, so that wherever we all were in different corners of the world, even or whatever, we were always in communication. So we knew about this. Alice was finally beginning to enjoy her life again. She was reconciling friendships. Um, she was exploring a, a new relationship. This should have been the start of something really good for her, but unfortunately, Dylan was not going to tolerate that. Saturday, the 1st of October, 2016. Alice was at home in her ground floor apartment in Gateshead. So Alice was on her own in the flat and then there's this knock on the front door. And when Alice looks out of the little peephole, there's no one there. And obviously that's worrying. And it happened two or three times at intervals during the course of the evening. And then she goes to bed. And then after she's gone to bed, there's this knock on the window right behind her bed. And when she opens the curtains, he's there. He's jumped in over that wall and he's left flowers and chocolates on the windowsill and he's backing off as if to say, um, OK, I'm going now. After leaving the flowers and chocolates, Dylan left Alice a chilling voicemail. He really loved Alice. He'd never, ever thought about killing her and he left the flowers and chocolates there because he didn't want to kill her. And, and he kept mentioning killing her, I think, was about seven or eight times in the conversation. This is, is language which really does set, set my radar off. And Alice is the best judge of her level of risk. So she knows Dylan incredibly well. She knows the, the patterns of his behaviour. And this incident is serious enough to have her calling the police. She really does feel in danger at this point in time. Hi there, um, I just need a bit of advice really, um, more than anything. I split up with my boyfriend about three months ago. He's hacked into my Facebook and also my phone. Tonight he's, um, well I had a knock at my door. and Well he'd, he'd sent me a message saying I've been in the garden since five. I had a knock at my door. And then um, he's come round the back, knocked on my bedroom window, he's like left. Um, some flowers and chocolates. My friends have been telling me to call the police. Well, it's making a note of the incident number, which is 59. 59. We've got a sort of fire. Brilliant, thank you. Off you, Alice. Thank okay. you. Then. Thanks, Thanks. Bye. Alice was comforted by the police response and a police information notice, or PIN, was issued against Dylan. In theory, the PIN would stop Dylan from approaching Alice again. At the time, Alice thought that, that she was protected and so she felt much better. And for three or four days after that, then um, she went to work and, and people at, at Sky said that she was... was, was almost back to her old self and she was happy again. Dylan is somebody to whom the rules don't apply. He thinks he's above the law. He's not going to be told by anybody else what to do. Uh, and this is a, a characteristic that we see a lot in abusers like him. Four days after the pin had been issued to Dylan, Alice received a parcel. In the parcel were some personal items of Alice's and a letter from Dylan. And he said, uh, you don't need to worry, I, 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 um, I will never come near you again. Um, I know you've got a new man. And that was, that, in, that last bit was horrifying in itself because um, Alice had um, met someone new about two or three weeks earlier. Alice had gone to great lengths to keep her new romance off social media. The only people who knew were her family. We believe he must have installed software 
on her phone, um, spy, spyware, um, so that he was actually spying on the WhatsApp conversations, which is a scary thought looking back. Um, but we, we, there was no other way he could have known of the existence of, of her new um, boyfriend. Alice called the police again, hoping to talk to the same officer who had previously helped her. But unfortunately, when Alice phoned the police, she got a call back from somebody who was quite unsympathetic. And they made Alice feel that she was making a fuss about nothing. And they asked her if she wanted him arresting. But unfortunately, the way they asked it was, you know, what do you want us to do about it? Arrest him. As if it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. So Alice sort of said, well, well, no, I suppose not. Alice was completely deflated. Alice um, rang me and told me about this second approach from the police. And she was so unhappy because she said, you know, she said on the phone, she said, Mommy, it's just never going to stop. He is never, ever going to leave me alone. And uh, so difficult as a parent to know what to say because I really naively and stupidly just wanted to make her feel better. So I said, well, yeah, well, Alice, if you just keep ignoring him, just keep ignoring him, he will eventually go away and leave you alone. October the 12th, 2016. Alice's flatmate, Maxine McGill, came home from work. She'd forgotten her keys, but knew Alice was there. Unable to get Alice to answer the door, she climbed through an open window. Please, I've just, I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Is she breathing? I don't know, I can't, I can't look, I'm sorry. Okay, I can't try, look. try and stay calm. Oh. Try and stay calm, what's your address? It's <laughs> Rolling Road. Is she covered in blood, did you say? Yes. OK, bear with us two seconds. <coughs> Alice! You're doing really well, Maxine. <coughs> oh. It's OK. Please help us. I don't know what to do. Are the whiskey <coughs> there now, Maxine? Yes, the police are here. The police officer's there? Yeah. OK. Um, close your phone down for me, Maxine. OK. Thank you. Bye. October the 12th, 2016. Alice Ruggles' flatmate, Maxine, had found her lying motionless in the bathroom of their flat in a pool of blood. Paramedics pronounced 24-year-old Alice Ruggles dead. As Maxine had told the emergency services, in her opinion, there was only one suspect. Maxine McGill knew exactly what had happened to Alice because she knew just how scared she was of Harry Dillon and just what he was capable of. And that 999 call, haunting 999 call of Maxine telling the police that her friend was dead and telling them straight away, Harry Dillon has done it. He's a psychopath. Senior forensic scientist Michelle Walton was the lead scientist at the crime scene. There was lots of blood staining within the scene and this painted a picture of what, in my opinion, had happened to Alice within that room. In my opinion, the distribution suggested that she had been positioned over the shower tray at the time she had sustained the significant injury to her throat. The distribution of blood within the bathroom itself and on her herself would suggest that perhaps she'd attempted to get to her feet having been on her knees but fundamentally she hadn't been upright having sustained the injury to her throat before she came to rest in front of the bathroom door. There was one man the police wanted to question. Within five hours, Trimmon Harry Dillon was apprehended at his barracks and brought to the station in Newcastle for questioning. Officers were also dispatched to Alice's parents' home in Leicestershire, England. They basically told us that, that, that Alice was, was dead. I think we immediately looked at each other and said his name. We knew instantly who'd done it. I knew 
that there was no way I could stand up and let the policeman out. It, I just, there's just no way I could stand up because I just, uh, all the blood had stopped circulating and I, you know, it was just like the worst thing you could possibly imagine. When Dylan was first questioned by the police, he denied having made any contact with Alice that evening. At this point, his objective is self-preservation, and he's just sitting there, he's keeping calm, because I think he is that arrogant that he thinks he's got away with this. A few days before the murder, we discovered that he'd made a reconnaissance trip down to Newcastle, because we found a photograph on his phone of the rear bathroom window at Alice's flat. He'd plainly been down to see how he might be able to get into the property. When presented with CCTV evidence that his vehicle was seen travelling from Edinburgh to Newcastle on the day of the murder, and that his mobile phone had pinged off several masts along that route, his story changed. I drove down towards Newcastle, and because I was, I, I just, I just wanted answers. So I, I drove down to speak to her. He was then shown dash cam footage of his vehicle parked near Alice's apartment within the time frame of the murder. He then stated it had all been an accident, which he would continue to claim throughout. She'd accidentally stabbed herself through the nose with the knife. She'd accidentally cut her own forehead with the knife. And she'd accidentally slashed her throat open at least six times, causing that terrible and fatal injury. When he's being interviewed, he is just kind of responding in the moment and his, his stories don't stack up, that there's not evidence to support the version of events that, that he's putting across. The evidence was mounting against Dylan. The police now needed the forensic evidence to place him in the bathroom where Alice was murdered. In terms of an offender, they might often discard the clothing that they're wearing, but they don't usually get rid of things that are personal to them, such as watches, jewellery, or even footwear. Some people might only have one pair of shoes. So we suggested that if he had anything on him, such as jewellery or a watch or wall glasses or his footwear, then we could examine those relatively quickly. He did actually have a Help for Heroes wristband and a silver bracelet that were recovered from him at the time of the arrest. So these were fast-tracked to the laboratory. So there was a small amount of blood that could be seen microscopically. Um, it was caught in the recess of the lettering. It was present in the O of the heroes and the R of the organisation, part of the wristband, but there was only two small blood stains present. So they were sampled onto a swab and then they were sent for DNA analysis and we were able to obtain a profile that matched the DNA profile of Alice Ruggles. This placed Dylan in the apartment and in contact with Alice's blood. A bloody fingerprint on the steering wheel of his car was also a match to Alice. No murder weapon was found and Alice's phone was missing. At the time, I did not believe that he was capable of doing what he did. But if I knew then everything I know now about stalking and controlling behaviour, it was so obvious that that was what he was going to do. Within 36 hours on Friday the 14th of October, the police had enough evidence to charge Dylan for the murder of Alice Ruggles. April 2017. The trial of Trimmon Harry Dylan for the murder of Alice Ruggles was at Newcastle Crown Court. The case for the prosecution was presented by Richard Wright, QC. Well, we, we could prove that Harry Dillon had been inside the flat with Alice at the time that she died. We could prove that he was obsessive, that he'd stalked her. But we had to prove that he'd also murdered her. That is, he had caused those terrible injuries. We all react in different ways. So I think some, some of us had the anger. I never had that. I think I was just numbed. 
it's almost as if some, for part of the time you're you're you almost feel as if you're looking in on this and then then you know in waves you realize no this is really really happening to me and this this guy is really he's just killed our daughter and he's just standing there in front of us well the story that he gave at trial was quite incredible he said that having got into her flat she was terrified and that she had armed herself with a knife and that he had simply been trying to calm her down and remove the knife from her and he gave this story that she had inflicted all of these injuries on herself accidentally with the knife what i hadn't been prepared for was the fact that he was trying to be controlling even in that courtroom and um, he basically presented his version of events. It just kept coming back to me what Alice had said to me. He doesn't know what the truth is. And, you know, he was, he was changing his story. Every time a little bit of different evidence came up, his story changed to try and accommodate that evidence. And it was all... this complete nonsense. Even at one point, as he was describing Alice bleeding to death on the bathroom floor. He turned to the public gallery in a moment I'll never forget, looked Alice's dad straight in the eyes and said to him that it was a shame he couldn't protect his daughter. I mean, he tried to claim that Alice's dying words were that she hated her sister, which was just completely weird I, I just don't I just don't understand how anyone could be so evil and horrible within two hours Dylan was convicted unanimously by the jury for the murder of Alice Ruggles at her home in Gateshead on the evening of October the 12th 2016 I don't think the verdict really mattered to Harry Dylan what mattered to him was that he'd had the stage He'd had two or three weeks when the whole world was focused on him, which was something that he loved. Trimmon Harry Dillon was sentenced to life in prison to serve a minimum of 22 years. A further 10-year tariff would have been added, but the judge dismissed that the murder was premeditated because it didn't appear that Dillon had arrived at Alice's apartment with a knife. He has been given you know, the, the, the sentence he deserved in law. Um, but of course, for us, we have a, a, a life sentence because um, Alice will never be back with us. Dylan appealed the sentencing decision, which was never brought before the court and finally abandoned. Since losing Alice, Sue, Clive and their family have set up the Alice Ruggles Trust and dedicated their lives to raising the awareness of and putting an end to stalking. I feel that we've got to raise a, a generation in, in 10 or 15 years' time when today's teenagers are tomorrow's young professionals and tomorrow's young society. We need to raise a generation for whom mention of the word stalking shocks, uh, 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 shocks people, and we've got to bring about that change. The police later apologised, admitting lessons have been learned. Everybody who Alice had asked for advice felt I could have made better advice, I could have done this differently. And I think, you know, it is... It's a sort of common grief reaction that, you know, I wish I had, had done things differently. But I think for all of us, we could have done things differently. And if we'd spotted that stalking earlier, we could have kept Alice alive, and I think... You know, you've, we're never going to, we're never going to recover from that because it, it would have made a difference. Trimmon Harry Dillon terrorised Alice Ruggles to fulfil his own twisted, misogynistic ego. He believed he could have any woman he wanted, and that women should worship him and be flattered to receive his attention. He took the life of Alice Ruggles because she had the audacity to say no to him making Trimmon Harry Dillon one of the world's most evil killers.